Great. Back on track. Um, yes, I am Ryan Blue. Um, I recently started a company called Tabular, um, which does some things, but we're mostly building out. And so, um, you know, we're not going to talk about Tabular today. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, basically open data platform trends and Apache Iceberg. Um, you know, where where is the community going? Um, so, in a normal Iceberg talk. I would of course start with what is Iceberg? What are all the amazing features that people need and, and love? Um, why should you use Iceberg? But um, we're not actually gonna do that today because I think <laughs> that kind of puts the, the cart before the horse, right? Where we really need to understand more of the context. Um, what are we doing today? And uh, more importantly, where are we going um, in big data infrastructure and big data architecture? Um, so that's what I've been thinking about lately. And it, it really reframes the project because I, listing a whole bunch of features doesn't really tell you why you would use something. Right? So we're not gonna start with that. We're gonna start with um, where we're at today and hopefully just think through um, what we need to build over the next three or five years. So in talking to people today, the, the current standard seems to be um, multi-engine, right? Uh, I don't think that I've talked to any sophisticated data organization that is able to do everything in Spark or 100% of their workloads in Trino or you know, completely on streaming, although I think a lot of people would love to be you know, completely on streaming or completely on batch. Um, what we're seeing is a, a mixture. Um, once a, an organization reaches a level of sophistication, um, we see Spark for ETL and ML workloads, Trino for ad hoc and ETL, Flink for streaming ETL, for streaming analytics, all sorts of things. Um, Druid in there or some other cubing solution for storing aggregates and making access to data and dashboards super quick. Um, so what we're, what we're seeing is a, a real multi-engine future. Um, for a while, I think we were waiting to see which one would win, right? Is an organization going to go towards streaming or batch? Uh, is Spark going to win out in you know, ETL or are we going to use some other thing? And now that this has been the norm for years, I, I think that it's time to stop thinking through um, which engine is going to win and think, okay, well, we've, we've got multiple engines that are now good at different things. Um, we, we need to build a data architecture that includes all of those. Um, Another thing that we're seeing today is that everyone is either in the cloud or moving there as quickly as possible. No one is really running HDFS or, or um, you know, custom data centers, or if you do, it's for a very specific purpose. Um, so a lot is moving to the cloud and you know, cloud stores uh, in place of HDFS are really, really popular. Um, and then the last is kind of a curious holdout um, we're seeing um, everyone still surprisingly uses the Hive Metastore. Um, now, there are also some people that are uh, going this no Metastore route and trying to just store things in S3, um, which seems to me a little crazy, um, trying to keep track of everything as in like, oh, we have billions of objects in S3. Um, that's our our, our warehouse, that's our metadata. Um, so we'll see if, if that route uh, works, but um, everyone appears to be standardizing on you know, one meta store, even though it doesn't work particularly well for a lot of different use cases. And um, on another side of this, um, I think that we're seeing whenever I talk to people, just more and more investment in data in people, so data engineers, data analysts, data scientists, and, and ML specialists, um, just trying to do new things, uh, answer questions, get data from a new source prepared so that other people can use it. We're seeing a huge investment um, across every business that we talk to. Um, we're seeing investments in tools, 
things to just make uh, a certain aspect of maybe observability easier? How do we keep track of all of the data across these different engines? Um, and then we're also seeing a huge investment in infrastructure. How do we make these tools easier to use? Um, how do we provide a Spark cluster or a Trino cluster um, and make sure that's fast? Um, it, it's really amazing what, what kind of investments are, are happening today. And I think that that investment is related um, to a, a pretty big problem here, which is that all these pieces, um, the, the Sparks, the Trinos, Hive Metastore, uh, S3 and, and other um, cloud object stores. These are like puzzle pieces that are, are you know, really quite beautiful. They do something amazing, but the pieces just don't fit together quite right. And you're, you're left scratching your head and saying, is this really how it's supposed to be, right? S3 is not a file system. And using it, um, we, we hit this really hard at Netflix, uh, using it made our tables eh, sometimes lie to us. And we had to work around that. And we, we applied a ton of just Band-Aid solutions to try and keep consistency in, in other places. Um, even though you don't have to do that today, there's still problems with like renaming, moving data, which is you know the norm for, for uh, the formats that we work with. Um, there, there are other things that don't even involve S3. So concurrent writes, for example, are just utterly broken. <laughs> um, if you're writing from Spark, there are times when you just cannot read from Trino, even though Trino is constantly there willing to go query a table and just see what happens. There are just so many inconsistencies where your tables can suddenly lie to you for no reason. Um, there are also other things where these pieces just don't quite fit together. So the Hive Metastore can store metadata about anything, but it's all sort of generic. You can make changes that don't make any sense. So you can take a, a CSV file, overlay a schema on top of it, and then say, oh, I'm gonna change this uh, string column to an int, and all of a sudden corrupt everything and have nothing but nulls in that column. Um, there are, even in the, the well-defined formats like Avro and Parquet, there are zombie column problems where uh, you might uh, delete a column, create one with the same name, write data into it, and then see that you're getting the old data for some reason. You're getting the data in the column that you deleted. Um, we ran into this periodically at Netflix where someone would create a table, write into it for a couple months, use a column that they thought they had uh, written correctly, and then say, oh no, that, that's full of bad data. Okay, well, we'll just delete the column, create a new column with the same name, fill that with data. Um, and then we'd see the zombie column problem. Because they have the same name, they look like the same column to engines. Um, we also, for some reason, can't rename columns. Even though Hive and Hive Metastore allows it, if you try to rename a column, um, everything goes through just fine, but in certain formats, you just created a new column. Now you have uh, the old name and the new name right beside one another. How do you fix that situation after you've already written data? Um, and then there are other things. How do we consume table changes? How do we actually do streaming from table to table? Um, how do we materialize views and, and keep them up to date? Um, there are a ton of challenges here. And although individual engines are really uh, super great at what they do, um, they don't fit together with one another in a single unified data architecture. Um, and that's really quite hard to work with, especially when you're, you're running into zombie data or uh, safety and, and uh, correctness issues. So that brings us back to Iceberg. And specifically, well, let's, let's talk and answer that original question. What is Iceberg anyway? Well, Iceberg is a table format. <laughs> Most people don't really know what a table format is, um, but you can think of it as a, something very similar to file formats, uh, where you might have a columnar file format that organizes data a certain way so that later it can look at the stats for that data and ignore large portions of it. A table format can do the same thing, but it not only affects performance, like being able to skip a whole bunch of data, it also affects transactional guarantees. So this is where Hive tables are simply unsafe. <laughs> um, 
iceberg tables allow transactions. So you can make any change to a table transactionally. Uh, you can uh, compact files. You can do basically anything that you need to do safely on that table uh, and safely uh, even when there are multiple concurrent writers, which is a, a really important thing for getting these pieces to fit together. Um, the second thing that Iceberg is, in addition to a way of tracking the data files and, and keeping track of what's in our table and the metadata for a table, it's a standard. So it's written as an open source specification as well as a reference implementation in Java that's been integrated into a whole bunch of different engines. So Spark, Trino, Presto, um, uh, you name it, a, a lot of them. <laughs> um, and, and that has been uh, actually really important uh, for the growth of the project. But you might be thinking at this point, well, we started talking about multiple engines um, that don't fit together, don't quite uh, work well with one another, are extremely hard and require this gigantic investment of people, people to, to maintain schedulers and consistency and say, oh, you can't read this table while I'm writing to it, and things like that. So how does a table format actually help that situation? Um, well, let's go back and think about the problems and how those pieces aren't fitting together. So really the pieces that we're talking about here are the compute engines here at the top. We have Trino, we have Flink, we have Spark, we even have things like Dask, uh, where we're seeing more and more people interested in real Python frameworks that can do the same sort of processing that we're seeing in the JVM. Um, but underneath those, you know, what fills this gap where everything can use the same data sets uh, at the same time? And you know, what are how are we going to solve those challenges of zombie columns, concurrent writes, and, and things like that. Well, let's think a little bit more about what, you know, what, what we need in that box, given all the challenges that we've been seeing. Um, so these are the ones that, that I think are really important. Um, this is if we want to share storage across all of these engines, which is really, really key, right? We're already building this architecture. Like this problem exists today. But if you put Hive in that box, you're in a world of pain. <laughs> so the, the, we have two sets of requirements here. First of all, they're, they're technical requirements. It has to be cloud native, right? Everyone is moving to S3. Everyone is moving to Azure or GCP, sorry, GCS. Um, you know, we need it to be cloud native and not do silly things like try and rename files to commit. Um, it must be scalable and performant. So this actually means not keeping data in the file system itself, because it's not a file system. It's an object store. <laughs> we don't need to be making, you know, a million uh, 70 millisecond round trip calls to figure out what files are in our table. We have to make it more scalable and performant than that. And it has to handle those transactions. And transactions, when we were creating Iceberg, we thought about it as single table transactions. But what we actually did was solve concurrent rights. And I think thinking about it in terms of concurrent rights and this multi-engine uh, situation in which we find ourselves is really the best way to think about the problem. So we have to handle concurrent rights, but those are just the technical things. On a practical side, we need this shared storage to be open, right? We, we need it to be something that engines can actually integrate on top of. So it can't be encumbered by, um, uh, the the problems of a closed project, right? It can't be owned by one single person letting you use a library because we need it to be neutral, something that every single engine, whether it's supplied by a vendor or is an open source engine, um, is willing to invest money in supporting, right? It needs to be able to handle their needs uh, and adapt to the needs of each processing engine that it's using. So it has to be neutral and open source. Um, the other thing here is that it can't just meet these technical requirements. It also has to address productivity challenges that we've seen over the years. So this is the zombie columns problem, right? If we're going to build a format that, uh, or, or you know, fill this gap with something, it has to fix all of the problems that we're seeing there. 
it can't just fix concurrent writes. Okay, so everything is safe except for renaming a column. That still breaks everything, right? We have to fix all the problems and not just some of them. Um, and of course, I'm arguing that Iceberg does that. <laughs> um, while we didn't realize it at the time, um, the, the puzzle analogy here really feels correct because once we started deploying Iceberg at Netflix, we saw all the pieces sort of coming together in ways that we didn't expect. Um, we added reliable transactions. Iceberg's initial three goals were reliable transactions and, and uh, you know, basically any change atomically with, with you know, acid semantics. We wanted to unlock some of the performance challenges that we were seeing specifically in S3 and on uh, cloud storage. Um, but in addition, we just had tables that were growing larger than we could handle in the old way. And so we needed to unlock performance and fix the cloud native nature. Um, but this last one, fix usability, is where we said, we really need to fix all these problems that are affecting analysts and data engineers and people that are not uh, you know, platform, data platform builders. Um, the, the zombie columns, the, the rename problems, um, also the, uh, the problem where people needed to understand the physical layout of a table um, just to have performant queries on it, you know, essentially making everyone a DBA. Um, you have to be a DBA and, and understand how en uh, processing engines work in order to be successful even querying the data. Um, those sorts of things really just aren't going to work um, if we don't fix those. Um, so what Iceberg allowed us to do at Netflix is build this, what, what we're thinking of as the open data platform, um, where we can use open data storage. That is you know, vendor neutral, it is uh, performant, it solves all of those challenges that, that we had, um, and that I, I outlined a minute ago. Um, and it allows us to do pretty amazing things. So now, not only are we able to use these uh, multiple engines, you know, the Trinos and Flinks and Dasks together, um, we're able to do that safely. And like I said, the puzzle pieces really start to fit together cleanly once you start using Iceberg. You can make a DDL change in Apache Spark that takes place over in Trino. Everything works as expected. It's pretty amazing what you can do. Um, and we're, we're still sharing data. So we're not, um, we're not copying data from one table to another location so that it can be used by Trino. Um, we can stream data in through Apache Flink and immediately query it in Trino. We can wait a while for it to you know, batch up enough to uh, translate it uh, or, or run ETL or ELT with Apache Spark. Um, you know, there, there's just a, a whole new set of possibilities. A new, set of poss a new possibility as well is this idea of a data service that does a very specific task on our tables. Now that we can rewrite safely and we have this concurrent write um, that we're able to do, we can start automating things clean off some of those rough edges. So instead of having a, a user that is responsible for knowing exactly how Spark is going to write out their data or Trino is going to write out their data and understand the internals of that system and what, what their SQL query is going to produce in an on-disk physical layout, we can provide data services that just make those problems go away. Rather than worrying about producing 100,000 files in a job with Spark, we just have a compaction service that goes and rewrites the data if it doesn't look quite right. And so this is an enormously powerful uh, new open data platform. Um, we're also looking at uh, pulling in vertical solutions or, or you know, the, the closed source things because external tables from like Snowflake um, are a really powerful concept. So if we have this center of gravity built around a project like Apache Iceberg, where we fixed all the problems that uh, <laughs> the MPP and, and cloud data, uh, data warehouse vendors um, laugh at. You know, if you go to Snowflake and say, hey, you know, we're, we're having a problem with uh, zombie data coming back in our columns, they'd say, well, yeah, that's because you're not using a real data format. But now that we've solved those challenges, external tables in, in places like Snowflake become a lot more powerful. 
So, you know, maybe we'll see this connection here that I showed as a dotted line from Snowflake or other vendors like Databricks to Iceberg. Um, it's a, a really uh, interesting space to see where we're headed in the next uh, five years. Um, and so that is, I think, one of the, the biggest transitions that we need to do. Um, the, the next, though, is it, this picture is still incomplete. So say we have a data format that solves uh, DDL challenges. It coordinates across a number of engines. It really uh, ties the room together, so to speak. Um, we're still missing so much here that we need to continue building. Uh, things like the Metastore. You know, Hive does not work well as a Metastore for the newer uh, formats like Iceberg. Um, what is next? What, what takes the place of this catalog? Um, we need to build all these data services that can interact with tables and, and do things automatically on your behalf. So cleaning up old versions, you know, doing vacuum operations, doing compaction, uh, rewriting and reclustering data. What do those services look like? Um, they're only possible in this new world, but it's time to start building them out. Um, and last, uh, we really need to solve the problem of access control. So. Access control is you know, completely different across all these engines. Trino, you can plug in your own implementation, you can get DCL statements, but that all applies in Trino. Uh, it doesn't apply to Flink or Spark. Uh, Spark doesn't have any uh, grant or revoke statements even in its uh, SQL dialect. So how do we tie those two things together and use these as a coherent data platform? That's still an open question. Um, so there's still a lot more to do, but Iceberg, I think, is a, a really great basis as the next step forward. And I'm really excited to see so many people adopting it and uh, using it as, as that layer in their, uh, their open stacks. Um, it's really creating this, uh, what we're calling a, an open data platform, uh, where the, the storage layer is open and accessible to everything. And you know, it's shared and, and can take on those workloads. So with that, I want to say thank you and open it up to questions. I hope that everyone um, got a, a great flavor for what Apache Iceberg is and what it does um, and how you, you know, want to be integrating it into uh, your data architecture. All right, thank you, Ryan, very much for the uh, great presentation. I actually have here uh, Ronro from uh, the Alexio team. I think she's got some questions from the audience uh, platform that she would like to discuss. Great. Okay, I have better luck on muting my, my mic. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Ronro, and uh, I recently joined Alexio. I was pre previously working on Presto at Facebook. Um, so one thing is like you've been mentioning Trino for most of the talk and uh, I think most people know Trino is a version of Presto. And uh, so um, do you have any uh, thoughts on like, are we gonna have a better integration with Presto as well with Iceberg or, or is it on the roadmap? Uh, that's one question. And yeah. uh, I also have, Go with Should this I answer <laughs> questions as they come, or um, do you want to ask all of them? At, okay, I'll just answer the first one. Um, so we we do have a connector in the Presto uh, DB community. Um, I don't exactly know what the status of it is, but I know that um, you know a lot of people have been interested in that. Uh, I think it was contributed by Twitter, um, and we're really excited to see that. Part of the, the promise of, of Iceberg is that Iceberg is a, a standard. It needs to be something that people can pick up. So the next database engine um, says, hey, we're going to use what everyone else is using. And we all sort of agree, like, this is how we're going to store data. Um, and, and this is a, a great example of that, where the Iceberg community really isn't involved in either the Trino or Presto implementations. They use the Iceberg library. Um, the, the integration uh, comes pretty naturally from there. Um, and you know, we're, we're there to support, uh, talk about why certain things are the way they are, um, get feedback about what extra metadata those engines would like to see. Um, but it is actually a pretty clean separation. 
Paul. Um, I so what's your thoughts on like I think you know iceberg is targeting at federation or like orchestration on data and Alexio is trying to do orchestration on files and there's talks later about like how to combine the two together so uh, what's your thoughts about the collaboration between the two communities you know I, I think it's it's great to see a, a caching solution like Alexio um, can you know really speed I'm, I'm sure you guys have uh, you know slides on and good data points on how caching can really speed up um, your, your query performance um, iceberg solves a lot of challenges as well so we index metadata so that you know query planning is super fast um, but it, it of, of course is always good to have you know fast access to the data as well you know something managing co-locating that data with your processing nodes and and things like that so um, I'm actually, you know, excited to see the next talk, which is, I think, on that. So <laughs> I'll leave it to that speaker mostly. We have another question from uh, Vadim. Um, and, uh, is there a real competition happening with uh, Delta Lake? What's your thoughts? Okay, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. So Delta Lake is, um, it, it's a substitute for Iceberg in that it is a table format that fixes the atomicity or, or transaction problem. Um, there are a few challenges with it. Um, it doesn't fix the things that Iceberg fixes. So Iceberg was built to be a you know vendor neutral community standard um, and fix things like those usability and um, you know real productivity problems for people. Um, so like Delta Lake still has zombie columns. Um, <laughs> for example, like if you want to do that then you know it, it just doesn't seem to fit the table stakes for this layer right um it, it's uh the open source and the closed source version um are very different as well so like a lot of the things that iceberg does in the open source format uh, because there is no closed version of iceberg um just aren't available in the open source version of delta so you know again if you're looking to have people invest time and effort into using some format. Um, keeping back all the good features doesn't seem like a great way to do that. Um, so we don't really think that uh, Delta Lake is, is trying to go after the community standard piece. Um, it looks like what they're doing instead is making it you know, absolutely well integrated with Databricks, possible to access from other engines, but not really going after like, how do we, tie all these things together, which makes sense because Databricks doesn't care about Flink. Do we have time for more questions or? Uh, what time is it? Um, it's 10.02, so I have more time, but I don't know if we need to get to the next speaker. Okay, we'll leave the rest of the questions on Slack if they do have any right. coming up in thank life. You guys. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate it. <laughs>